Hi, my name is Cal Evans. This is about building APIs with Silex. Now, this talk was originally designed for an hour. They gave me 45 minutes. So while Keith was very nice and took a very slow pace, I'm a five-year-old with a bag of sugar here, okay? We're going to have to run through this very quickly. Now, you can take a little more money. It's not a big deal. You can eat in my time. Because <laughs> <laughs> we have a buffer at the end. So. Oh, okay. Um, well, I normally talk this way. I, I just started a brand new job, and the very first thing I had to do was show up at the off-site in um, Mountain View, California. So we were having this whole thing, and my boss asked me to get up and give a presentation on how to talk to developers, because I work in a marketing department. I woke up one morning and found out I'm not really a developer anymore, I'm a marketer. But um, I work in a marketing department, and so I got up there, and I'm just, I, I am just running through this presentation, and people are like, you got that deer in the headlights look. So if you get that, I'll know I'm talking a little too fast. Um, we're going to talk about building APIs with Silex, or building an application with Silex. Uh, we do actually talk about APIs, but it's at the very end. We have to build up to that, okay? That's the big reveal. Um, if you've not, have anybody worked with Silex? No? Okay. It's, uh, oh good, a couple. Um, it, it's based on the Symphony framework. Um, and I, I've built a sample application. You can grab the sample application there um, off the GitHub. Also, this is the current joined in for this talk. If you would, please, um, if you like what you see, go out there, um, rate me, give me some feedback. If you don't like what you see, please tweet. Um, I am at Keith Casey, or at Casey Software. So. <laughs> that doesn't get any better after 25 times. Not for you. They've never heard this I stuff. I got a bunch of new people. <laughs> They've not heard my joke. Well, Ben, ben and Ed have, and yeah, they don't get any better. <laughs> I, I have the same five jokes I've been telling for the, same, for the past seven years. So, anyhow, um, the sample application. I never like to give a, a, a really useful sample application because then people get caught up in the using the sample application and they lose the concept. So this one is very simple. It goes out to um, careers.stackoverflow.com, grabs the RSS feed and um, geocodes them and puts them out on Google Maps. So this is where the jobs are. Um, and oh, I'll bring it up real quick just to show you what it looks like. Um, but I, I don't want you to get too hung up on that. But if you go, if you're if you're interested in playing with it, um, you can go out and grab the source code. See, nice and pretty. And see, we even have some right there in Indianapolis. Let's see if I can get the mouse. These are the companies hiring here in Indianapolis. And if you're looking for a job, those are the best places to start looking. If you work for one of these companies, you might want to check and see if that's your job up there. Um, <laughs> but that's all it does. Um, let's see if I can get back to. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about what Silex is and what it is not. First of all, Silex is not a micro framework. It is a smallish framework. My good friend and fellow attendee, Mr. Ed Finkler, PHP's own Unibomber, um, <laughs> wrote a great piece uh, for his blog called the PHP, um, the Micro PHP Manifesto, which he covered. So I won't go into detail on. But needless to say, Silex does not come anywhere near what Ed defines as a micro framework. Matter of fact, I ran C-Lock on it. Um, it has 69,000 lines of code just to install Silex and the pieces that it actually requires from Symfony. There are actually more blank lines in Silex and the pieces of Symfony than there are in um, lines of code in my actual application. So this does not fit the definition of a micro framework, even though on the homepage for Silex it says PHP micro framework. It's not really. But it's still very useful. And um, one of the things I love about PHP, and I tell this to everybody um, when I'm talking to people about why I use PHP, is I can fire up an editor, write 20 lines of code, and prototype something and say, is this idea going to work? Okay. If the code works, if everything works the way I, um, I think it does, then, of course, I have to answer the, the next question, can I make money at this? And if so, do I want to use a framework on it? Well, Silex allows me to do that. Silex allows me to prototype things very quickly. There's not a lot of yak shaving involved. I, that's another term I had to explain to the marketers. They'd never heard the term yak shaving. But there's not a lot of yak shaving involved. Um, you just basically start coding. Um, so you can, you can build the prototypes. Now, 
It's also very, very good if your end product is an API because it is very REST-ish friendly. If you're building a RESTful or REST-ish API, you can build, build full-blown RESTful APIs. Most of the times what I build is REST-ish because I don't follow all of the conventions of REST. Um, and I stopped calling them REST APIs because guys like Ben Ramsey go all over me about um, the use of the term REST. So, um, But I, it, it's wonderful for building APIs because a lot of the functionality is built in to make that very easy. And we're going to look at that um, towards the end. What it isn't good for. If the, the, the sample application that I showed you has one route that actually displays HTML, and that's the, the root route. Everything else um, is a REST um, endpoint that just returns JSON, okay? If you're building a full-blown MVC API, you're going to include so much of Symfony that you might as well use a full-blown um, uh, uh, framework, whether that be Symfony or Zen framework or whatever, you'd be much better off in, um, in, in starting from there instead of trying to add on the pieces necessary to make Silex work. Now you can. You can put, um, you can use Twig as your uh, view layer and um, add all the different pieces. I just don't recommend it because at that point you're just you're just duct taping things together, and you will hit a point where the duct tape is going to fail because duct tape does fail. Nope. So let's look at. We got that there. Okay, y'all can see that. Um, Let's look at what it takes to actually build, real quick, a um, Silex application. I'm going to do some live coding. I do the live coding because this is either going to go very well and you go, so, damn, that's, going to, that's easy, or it's going to fail miserably, in which case this is the comedy portion of the show. Quit looking at me like that. Um, <laughs> okay, um, let's make us a directory. Okay, I've got a test directory. Now, I have a prepared composer JSON file. Anybody use composer while we're waiting for this to download? And I'm hoping that the internet here is going to be fast enough. You know, if not, Keith, you're going to have to stop your torrents. But um, the, the composer. While this is downloading, I'll swap back to my slides, if I can get back to my slides. Yeah. The, the hardest thing for me to get, the, get a handle on when I started working with Silex was Composer. Because I was trying to con treat Composer like Pair. And once I realized Composer is not Pair, it is not supposed to be Pair, it's not a Pair replacement, it doesn't do what Pair does, then I began to understand what it does, and I found that it is one of the more useful tools to enter the PHP um, toolbox in quite some time. Um, Composer just allows us to install libraries that people have prepared for Composer. It's incredibly useful. If you're not using it now, please go take a look at it. Install it and start using it. Um, go out to the package, packages.com. Dot org where they keep all their packages. Yeah. Dot, org, org. dot org. Okay, um, it, it's where the dot repo something. is. Yeah, it's dot something. But put in packages in Google, it'll come up. So let's see. As um, as you can see, it's starting to install all the different pieces. Um, it finally got down to installing Silex, and then it's going to recommend that we install a bunch of other stuff. Now, while that's there, we go. It recommends. I recommend you install all of these, but, or suggest it, but eh, we're not really serious about it. Okay. Let's get rid of that one. I'll save. New. Okay, we're going to start by creating our um, index.php. And the first thing we have to do is require the autoloader. Composer will takes care of the autoloader for all the packages that it installs. Now, you can also, in your Composer JSON, the file that I just copied over, you can tell it, now I have these other packages or namespaces that I want you to add to your autoloader so I can autoload those, but it, you're not managing those. So it is very flexible in that respect. But in this case, we're just going to add the autoloader, and Composer installs everything in the vendor directory. So that's where all the Symfony components are, that's where Silex is, and that's where the autoloader that it has generated for us is. 
the next thing we do is create our Silex app object. So we say app equals new Silex application. If you see me make a typo, after you stop laughing, please point it out, okay? Um, it's not nearly as funny if, if you let it just, or let me just um, try to run it that way. So you want to laugh and point? Well, most people already laugh, so. Laugh yeah. first and point. Yeah. <laughs> Order of operations can be important. <laughs> okay. We create our application, we create a get root, um, an API endpoint for slash. So um, this one's actually called test.local. Test.local slash will run this anonymous function, which is just going to output PHP info. I freaking hate anonymous functions. Silex has them all over the place. I have learned to work with them, but I hate them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Do what? I, as little as possible. Okay. Yeah, because they've got it also. <laughs> like this is going to be any different than every other time. Yeah, that was the problem. Okay. We've saved that. Now we can just go over to Mozilla. Firefox, I'm sorry. Test.local. Oh. <laughs> oh! Yeah, I included the autoloader. Ah, oh, yep, there it is. Okay. <laughs> Do you have? Let me just double check this. What's your error so, reporting? Good, good. Uh, at this, uh, error reporting should just be wide open because this is a development box. Did it get any better? No. Okay. Then let's try. Always. Oh, there it was. Okay. I had a backslash instead, or a slash instead of a backslash. There we go. Okay. So that's all it's taken to, to do that. Okay. We've, do, we've got the anonymous function. We've defined it as a get. Now, if I tried using curl to do a put or a post or anything else, I'd get a nice little Silex error message saying that you've not defined a route for put or post or any of the other um, HTTP verbs, we've only defined get. And then once we define it, we just run it. Now the only other thing I'm going to try to live code, yeah, let's do one more route. Okay. Did I mess something up? No. Nope. Oh, <laughs> yeah, help. Thank you. In this case, we're defining a route variable. We define the route variable by saying um, slash hello and in the curly braces name. And we have to, this has to exactly match this, and we have to define it as an input into our, our parameter of our function. And then we can just use it. I'm just echoing out. Actually, I'm not even echoing out at this point. And this should, oh, wait, the one thing that I've got to do is
put my HD access file in here. It's just um, turning on mod rewrites. It says anything that comes in that doesn't already exist, send it to index.php. But if you forget to do that, it does not work, as I have found. <laughs> kind of like that. Oh. No, it's there. Okay. Anyhow, I'm going to move right along. That should have output a nice little hello cow. It did. It did. It did. It just told you that in there, too. Oh, did it? Yeah, you got the hello cow. Oh, did I get the hello Okay. Oh, yeah, sure did. Okay. <laughs> Thus ends the comedy portion of our show. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> live coding's always fun. <clears throat> because you never know. I mean, I've done that um, I've done that five, six times. Twice I have gotten it absolutely right. Once went horribly wrong. Believe it or not, this was not horribly wrong. Um, but once went horribly wrong. But um, that just shows you. I mean, right there we have um, created an application with two routes. We've created them using anonymous functions, and that's what I mean about prototyping. I can go in there, I can set up a route, I can use an anonymous function and just start writing code. Matter of fact, with Silex, you can actually write your entire application in your index.php. Now, please don't go tell people that Cal recommends you do this. <laughs> but um, when we were in Buffalo at um, CodeWorks, Afterwards, um, Mike, the guy that runs the Buffalo uh, PHP user group, came up, had his laptop, and he showed it to me where he had an entire application written for Silex in his index.php. They have a makerspace there, um, you know, big heavy tools, welding stuff, um, computers, all kind of fun things, and they have to control access to it. So they have card readers at all the doors. All the doors and the card readers have little Arduinos, and they have a Raspberry Pi running PHP that is their server. And he had written the entire application that controls door access and the membership list in about 250 lines of code in his index.php. And it was running Silex. So you can actually do that. But it allows you to get up and running quickly, test this idea out with full access to all the pieces of, your, of a framework instead of just having to write in the, the little, um, you know, the, write bare metal PHP and have to figure out different things like, you know, do I want to use the PDO driver or the MySQL driver or stuff like that. You've got access to all those pieces already. Um, do I actually show the... No, I do not. Um, the, com your composer.json, composer runs off of a JSON file and you have to hand edit that file. And I absolutely hate hand editing JSON. I mean, it's just one of the stupider things we have to do. But I've looked at it and there's just no real good way of um, building this thing, in the, or building an interface that does this. But there are two parts to the Composer JSON. The first is the require, and in our case, we have a require Silex. Um, if you look at the one that is, uh, the, in the case, of the case of the test, all we have is require Silex. If you look at the one that um, comes in the sample application, there's a couple more pieces that are actually required. Yes? I think the Composer now has a, it's not going to be the end-all, be-all thing for auto-generating Composer.json, but Composer.var, Oh, I knew they're working on, like, um, Fabian has released a skeleton for what the application should look like, but I didn't know that they could do that. But that would be good, because if they can just give you a starting point, that's good. They, the, the hardest thing was, for me was getting the initial composer.json file written. In fact, I think I eventually went to some other project and just copied theirs out of GitHub and started with that and changed things. Um, the other thing that it has is, like I said, it builds an autoloader for you. Okay, it's a PSR zero autoloader. If you have other namespaces that you want included in there, but you don't want Composer to manage for you, like in the case of um, the sample application, we have um, I have a namespace called Cal Evans, which is libraries that are generic to the application but um, not managed by Composer, and then the um, namespace Scan Jobs, which is the name of the application. That's the base application. I wanted Composer's autoloader to know those. So I just add them to the autoloader section, and when it generates the autoload.php, it, it puts the information in there so that all of your stuff gets auto loaded automatically. The only other thing you need to know about Composer, and um, this took me by surprise because I, I was brand new to it, um, Composer basically uses Git to pull things out of GitHub. Okay, That's where all the libraries reside. And if you don't add the vendor directory to your Git ignore, 
it's going to piss your git off, okay? And your git's going to try to um, pull in all of those things, and all of those projects have .git directories and .git ignorers in there, and it's really going to—it's not going to give you the results you want. But on the other hand, since all of those are managed already, you don't need to include them in your um, repository. So adding it actually makes a lot of sense. Once I figured that out. So one of the things um, that I really love about Silex is it has no project structure. Um, anybody that's ever worked with Zen Framework, and I'm sure Symphony's like this, but I've never worked with Symphony. Um, Zen Framework has a very strict, this is how the directory structure needs to be set up. Um, Silex doesn't have that. Like I said, you can write the entire thing in your index.php if you feel like it, or put it all in your document root. Have been the difference between document root versus application root. Okay. Um, you can put the, everything in your document root for all Silex cares. Um, Composer does have one restriction uh, or one requirement and that is that it will create a vendor directory and keep everything it, it, that it loads in that vendor directory but that's really the only thing that's imposed upon us from the outside <clears throat> I on the other hand am much more of you know I, I'm gonna say this and you're gonna tweet it I know it I'm much more of an anal no anal retentive that's the word I'm looking for um, anal retentive <laughs> I didn't, I didn't <laughs> I didn't say retentive in Toronto, and that got, that got several tweets. I'm much more of an anal retentive programmer, so I create this directory structure for me. So under my scan jobs, as you can see, I've got my app directory, and that's where all my, my code for this is, and it's broken out into several subdirectories. Um, app is also where my bootstrap um, sits. So you've got the app directory, you've got bootstrap. Uh, I've got a, a, there's a CLI component to this, and we'll look at it. Uh, but the CLI has a dispatch script, that's also in the app directory, but the rest of it is just um, broken down into subdirectories. My config directory, now this is where my config files are, we'll talk about config files in a little bit. The only thing important to note is I always exclude my um, config directory from my repo. Um, my config files are JSON files and I have scripts in my um, scripts directory that create them for me, so I never include them in my repo because I can recreate them on the fly, and I never really want my development um, config file on my production box anyhow, just as a safety measure. So I never create it there. Uh, the public, that's just the document root, we all know that one. Scripts, I'm always surprised at the people that forget to put scripts in there. And you can tell the people that haven't figured this out because you go look at their um, application root and there's five or ten little, you know, recreate database and, you know, re or fix database.php and all these little scripts in there. Just go ahead and create you a scripts directory. Any of the, every project has these little um, hip pocket programs that have to be run on a regular basis. Put them where they belong. Source is where my libraries that are not managed by Composer, uh, but not specific to this, um, this application go. Temp. Temp is where I um, copy my data file. I'm using SQLite on this project. Temp is there specifically so that I have some place to copy that data file over before I do something stupid. Because a lot of times I'm doing something stupid. And if I don't copy that over, then I've got to go write code to fix it. Uh, temp is also where the home for things like um, test1.php, test2.php, any of these little things you'd want to try. Don't look at me like that. I, I've seen your work. You've got these. Um, you know, these little things that, wait, I, does this work? Well, put them in the temp directory. The temp directory should be the same, or should be treated the same as any Linux temp directory, um, slash temp. It, um, your application should be able to survive with everything in there being deleted. And then the vendor directory, we talked about that. Um, the only thing to note is, again, put that in your gitignore. You don't want that in your repo. So, configuration files. We touched on that just a minute ago. Um, when we installed it using um, Composer, you saw Composer suggests you install this, and this package suggests you install that. And one of the ones, if you were paying attention, it says um, uh, Silex su suggests you install um, Symphony slash YAML. And YAML is yet another markup language. And what I don't need in my life is yet another markup language. We've got great, thank you, we've got, um, I'll be here all week. We've got great tools like JSON built into PHP. We don't need other um, languages to, to handle this. The problem is um, Silex expects you to use YAML. Well, luckily for us, um, Igor, and I, I can't pronounce Igor's last name, he's one of the two authors of um, Silex, wrote a configuration service provider that will allow us to use JSON files to, do, uh, to, to configure our application. 
So that's what I chose. Um, I did not choose the YAML option. I just parts of me just can't do that. Um, but now that I've got now I've got a problem, I need to edit some more JSON files because I mean this, these are simple things. Where's my application root? What are my database credentials? The things that are specific to the the environment we're running in, whether that's development, testing, acceptance, or production. You know, you, but it, they can vary from um, from one to the other. So instead of editing JSON by hand, I simply wrote me some scripts. Oops, I, I wrote me a script for each environment that creates an array and I store the values in the array and then I just output it to my config directory. Now I check those into my um, source code control. I do not check the configuration files in. I can recreate those at any time. Okay, the bootstrap. Um, in most cases, the bootstrap is the common code. Uh, or, or actually, the, the bootstrap is everything other than what it takes to get the application up and running off the ground, or up and running. Um, in my case, or in the case of sample application, we have both command line and web route available to us. So the bootstrap is the common code between them. Um, it's, in, it's in the app directory, it's called bootstrap.php. Do I show it? Oh, good, we do show it, okay. Um, but the main principle here is do not repeat yourself, okay? I, there are certain things that both the CLI and the web have to do to get the application up. That's what goes in my bootstrap. If you're just doing web or you're just doing CLI, then your bootstrap looks a little bit different because some of the stuff from your dispatch can go in there. Um, and the other thing is security because um, from the web point of view, you want to put as little as possible in that dispatch script, your index.php. You want to get it all out of there so that it's much more difficult for Apache to leak that information. Um, Apache, if misconfigured, will display your PHP instead of run your PHP. If you don't believe me, ask the people that were running Dig three or four years ago when <laughs> there for 10 minutes, they were just showing their, their PHP scripts instead of actually showing Dig. So for security reasons, we try to get it out of the area that Apache has direct access to because Apache can't get to your application root, PHP can. Apache only has access to your, um, your document root. Okay, so here's what Bootstrap looks like. Um, I set an environment variable in my HT access for development or my HTTP conf um, in production. And so I, I, I go get that. And if I can't find it, then I assume production because that's a safe bet because production is the most locked down of them. I, I don't display error messages or anything like that. But I get that. I create my um, Silex application and I register my service provider. Now up to this point, we don't have access to any of the information in the configuration file. Now that I've done that, and I take that variable and I put it right there. Now that I've registered it, um, I have all that. I have access to all that, and I can use any of it. And I do use it right here when I register my. Um, I use the Doctrine debout. I do not like um, ORMs. I'm not a big fan of them. But Doctrine has a great debout uh, database abstraction layer that allows me to qu very quickly get ac uh, switch backends. And in this case, that was important because I started working in uh, SQL Lite but I have plans to take this code and put it on one of my production servers, and at that case, I'm gonna wanna run it in um, MySQL. But as you can see, now I have access to the um, DB options. This confused me for a little while when I was starting to look at the example codes. Return app, because we're just gonna, um, we're just gonna require once this, and I, I'd never seen that before in 12, 13 years of PHP programming. I'd never seen a return vector. It's in the manual, Cal. <laughs> Do you know how big the manual is? Come on. I read the parts I need to read. But anyhow, I've never seen that. But once I started looking at it, it it's a phenomenal idea. Do I have, is the next one? Oh, yeah. It's... Okay. And here's what it looks like on the other side. This is our web dispatch script, our public index.php. And we say app equals require bootstrap. Now, in the PHP four days, for those of you not old enough to remember, I'm going to recount the tales of the old ones. Um, in the PHP four days, um, you, the, the most common way to build an application was index.php said require header.php, require body.php, require footer.php. That was how we did it. And then you had all this other stuff that was required, and you could have three or four um, levels deep of requiring files, and the HTML and the PHP was all built into those files. 
The problem was when something went wrong, you had to go figure out where it went wrong. Or if you were trying to figure out where a variable was created, you had to do a lot of grepping to figure out exactly where that variable was created. This does away with that. I know exactly now where app comes from, okay? It comes from my bootstrap, it's returning it. Now, it's not actually necessary because app's in the, the, works, the, the global space. But it is much clearer to do this this way. Okay, we're in our index.php. We've required our autoloader. We've got our, uh, we, we told it we're going to use our controllers. And here's where we mount them. Now, Silex does not require controllers, but when we um, start looking at the API, you'll see that um, once you get to a certain level of complexity or a certain number of routes, it's easier to start grouping them as um, controllers. And here's where we mount them. And I can say here, mount the jobs controller for anything that starts with slash jobs. So um, scanjobs.local slash jobs slash city name will call um, the city name route in my jobs controller. But once I'm in the jobs controller, I don't have to worry about this anymore because that's already been um, supplied. And then we push the whoopee button. <laughs> it's a technical term. Uh, okay, I love programming on the, C, um, on, on the command line, okay? Uh, I, I really like writing stuff that runs from the command line, not the web, mainly because I suck at web design, okay? I'm a middle tier guy, I'm a back end guy. I am married to a wonderful crayon, the lovely and talented Kathy, but I suck at it. So, um, when I found out I could do this with, uh, do command line programming with Silex, I was very excited because up to this point, I could do command line programming, but if I had a big application, say Zen Framework, if I had a big Zen Framework application, it took a lot of jury rigging and duct tape to be able to use the components of my um, framework in my command line. Matter of fact, I actually wrote a, uh, I've got a talk that I gave about a um, component that I wrote that replaced the Zen request object just for the command line, or just so you could use it on the command line. It wasn't pretty, but it actually got the job done. So this is what our dispatch script looks like for the command line. And this is in app, and it's called console.sh. And we, it looks a lot like the, um, the index.php. We require um, the autoloader. <coughs> but here, we register a console service provider. And then once we've registered it, we grab that and we start using dollar sign application instead of dollar sign app. And that's just a wrapper for dollar sign app but it um, gives us access to command line variables and it doesn't expect to go out to, to a, um, a web browser. And here I just register, instead of controllers, I'm registering commands. Now, if you're writing a, um, MVC properly, all of your heavy lifting is in your models, not in your controller. Your controller is nothing more than a traffic cop. And your commands are going to look very similar. They're the traffic cop. Your heavy lifting is in your models, and that's where we get our code reuse with, um, with this, is we can now call our models that we've built for the web from the command line. And I, um, oh, in this case, I'm actually, um, my geocoder, I wrote a little geo wrapper for Google's geocoder um, API, and uh, I'm just, I, I'm, I create a new, um, where is it, oh yeah, I create a new geocoder and then I um, add it to the application. I add two more. Um, new database. I, I got tired of having a separate script to recreate the database every time I need to start over, so I just created one. And work. Now, work is just an all purpose generic command. We'll take a look at it in a second. I highly recommend in your development phase, keep one of these registered and handy because you do things like run a command without having backed up your database and then you gotta go fix the database. Well, you've got one ready to go. Yes, I did that. And then from the CLI, you push the whoopee button. You see, I say that just to make you giggle now. Um, why the CLI? Well, you get the, you get the code reuse. There are things that make sense to do from the, um, the command line. Uh, in this case, the actual call to scan um, careers.stackoverflow.com um, 
is a, a, a CLI command because I never want to <coughs> expose that to uh, or make that an API call and expose that to be you know people being able to do it uh, at random. I never want I, I didn't want to have to bother with um, building in security to keep people from doing that at random because it's an API. And part of me says there are certain commands that I should not have to fire up a web uh, or a, a um, an, in, an instance of Apache or an Apache thread and fire up um, wget just to run something that I can easily run right there on the box. Um, just it, it just easier for or for me or it feels better for me. Um, and you get a lot of these with utility scripts and stuff like that. When I used to run DevZone um, back before it was, um, it's now run on WordPress, but back when it was written in Zen Framework, I used to have um, several utility scripts for managing the cache. Do I want to clear all the cache? Do I want to clear this piece of the cache? Stuff like that. Every application's got these little utility scripts. Well, using Silex and the, um, the command line service provider, you can now build that using access, or having access to all the pieces of your framework. This is just a real quick example of what one looks like. This is my work command. As you can see, it does nothing here except output that was done. We do have output, or we do have access to input and output. Input gives us um, all the request variables that are coming in or that came in on the command line. Output gives us a way to talk to the um, the, the client, which is the terminal. Um, the only thing required, or th these two functions are required. In this function, though, the only thing required is your set name. You have to give it a name and you have to give it a description. Because right now if I go in there and just type um, app slash console dot sh, it's going to give me a list of all the commands that are standard in that help, list, these kind of things. And then it's going to give me a list of all the ones that I've registered, the name I've registered, and the description. That's how we, we saw that in the um, CLI bootstrap. That's how you register one. Okay. We've done all the yak shaving. We're now ready to talk about APIs. Um, everybody understands the uh, the four basic HTTP verbs: get, put, post, post, delete. Um, these days, patch. No, get, put, post, delete. Okay, okay. Freaking with me. Okay. Um, what about options? Come on. No, that's not one of the standard ones. Most people don't do that. You do that. Most people don't. Um, but the um, reason it's taking so long to get to this point is this application has very little in the way of front end. It's all the back end. So I need to show you all of the infrastructure to get to this point. But quite honestly, most of that infrastructure took less time to build than it did for me to describe it to you. And that's, again, one of the things I love about Silex. Built into Silex are methods for get, post, delete, and update. And if that's the, the only thing that you're doing, then you can use those. Um, here's an example of what, some would, what they would look like. You'd say app get slash info and output the public uh, PHP info. That's very similar to what I did in the um, testing. I can also do a put for that. So if I use um, curl to put to that slash info, it's going to work. Post and delete also. Um, since I have not defined options, if I use um, curl and specify the options verb, this is going to return an error. However, there's more than just those four variables, or those four methods. And what I found was that there are times when I need to run the same code for two of them, because um, some of them make sense to gang them together. So what, in, if you look at the code in the um, sample application, you'll notice that the early code is written using those four methods. But very quickly, I got to the point where I was like, we're going to use the match and method combo. And using match and method, it looks like this. I could say match slash info run this anonymous function for these, ver these verbs. And you just give it a um, pipe delimited string of the verbs you want it to run. Now, this one uses all of them. Um, here's what it would look like um, more normally is I've got one to do the get. I've got one to do the post. Um, I've got um, delete and put makes sense to, to gang them together. And um, patch, head, and options. See, look, options, okay? Get over it. Um, I, I've got the options method here. So that's using, I see you totally. Um, using matching method is a much easier and more common sense way of doing that, even if you're only specifying one at a time. Um, I, I got to the point where it's just easier for me not to have to make the decision. 
um, whether which one to use. Also, um, had options, um, patch, and any of the other other than the four standard HTTP verbs, or the regular um, HTTP verbs, are not do not have native methods in the application. So if you're going to use any of the other ones, you're going to have to use this anyhow. It just makes more sense to use it everywhere and to standardize on it. And everybody knows about the new patch, right? It's it's like put, but you only have to do you you, you can do a partial record. You don't have to put. You have to give it the entire record back, or you're supposed to give it the entire record back. Patch, you can just update. <laughs> ben will cover it. <laughs> and um, only use options if you know if you're a douchebag. Um, <laughs> I'll pay for that later. Right now. <laughs> <Sweet>. <laughs> That'll get me in more trouble. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, um, sure. Route variables. I showed you how to define and use a route variable. What I didn't show you was you can keep going on beyond that. Okay, I said hello slash and then a, pla a placeholder for the name. You could do, uh, in, in a real world application, you might have um, slash customer and then a route variable for the customer ID. But if you want the invoices for that customer, you would say slash customer slash 42 slash invoice or invoices and they give you a complete list of all the invoices or you could say slash invoice and then you know 52 and it would give you the invoice 52 for customer 42 assuming that that one existed so you don't have to end your route in a route variable you can keep going on um, beyond that for as long as it makes sense you just have to make sure that when you define it using the curly braces, that the function that you define to handle that route also um, defines it as an input parameter. And yeah, we just looked at that. We, um, we define it in the curly brace, and they are positional in PHP. So first name, if I was doing first name, last name, I'd say um, last name out here, it would have to be first name, last name, okay? Mounts versus routes. Now, up to this point, I've shown you two ways to do it, but, uh, two ways to um, define routes, but I didn't really tell you how they work together. Um, in my case, once I got to, to the point where I was defining different pieces of the route, where I have jobs and I have cities, and I also have um, technologies that are tags that they tag things with, um, my routes start. My list of routes started getting very long, and so I. I started uh, reading around and you can define controllers and mount the controller and then you define the rest of the route inside the controller. And that's how we did, we, we showed you how to mount them. Let's look at um, how you use them. One thing that it will do, you have to define the, uh, in your um, controller, you have to define connect and it always gives you an instance of the app or a reference to the app, okay? I always stored this off in my controller and when I get in here, I store the, uh, I create a, a, a property for it, and I store it off because your app has your database connect connection, and your controller doesn't need it, but your models are going to need access to the database. So if I store it off here, I can always hand it to my models when necessary, or hand it just a just the um, database portion of it. I usually hand them the whole thing. Now. I told you I hate anonymous functions because they just create ugly code, in my, in my opinion. One way I got around this, and this is not the only way in Silex, this is just the way that I did it, was to define my anonymous functions as variables in my connect, and they simply call methods of the controller. Okay, So this way I get back to putting the code where it belongs in methods in my controller, and um, I can just define it as my variable, and then down here, Get jobs list, I use it. So in my jobs controller, if you just call um, scan host, or um, I'm sorry, scan jobs dot local slash jobs, it's going to execute this function, which is going to call that method of the um, controller. Everybody see how that works? Yes? I have a question. So it doesn't let you do uh, regular callables in PHP, it forces you to do a closure? No, it lets you do a callable. Now, see, I, I've tried that. Maybe I just don't have the um, updated version of, um, of Silex. I, I can define, I, I could do a method here. Um, there's also, and you know, how I did it before, which is yeah. defining a function there. Um, and, and in talking with Igor, he says I can also define it as, as a string, jobs controller, colon, colon, get jobs list. 
and it would parse that. It would not call it as a static, but it would parse that and make that call. Um, and you could be right. I, I just have uh, maybe I've not delved into it. Later. Okay. A lot of stuff what you're talking about. Yeah, I'd like to see that because I, I'm not real happy with either of the ways that I know how to do this, and I'd like to see a better way to do it. Um, from the app, which we got here, we grab the jobs con or the controller factory, and we have to return that in this um, connect function. But this is where we define our route is in the connect function. And then just, this is what, this is a continuation of my jobs controller. This is what the actual um, method looks like. I um, use my job object and call a static method called um, fetch jobs list. Right now it's hard coded to only display the US jobs. Um, Careers.stackoverflow.com is not so, is not as confined or is not as controlling. Um, and I hope to be, I hope to get rid of that real quick. I just haven't taken the time to, to do that. Um, you can in there, you can say scanjobs.local slash and give it a US city name and it will actually zoom in on that city and just show the job, well, it'll, it'll zoom in on that city. It still plots all the jobs in the US, but you don't see them because you're zoomed in on that city. That gives me a result. Then I create my payload array and my results are part of that pay payload array. Now, I do not pretend to be an expert on REST, Hadios, or um, Hypermedia APIs, but it is my understanding that I can return something in this also like underscore, what is it, links, underscore links, I believe is the standard, and allow the client to self-discover other pieces of my, in my API that are relevant to the call that's being made. In my case, one of the things I often do is return a um, message variable. And that's not usually for consumers or to be displayed on the web, but like if I'm not returning any jobs, I might tell the developer no jobs found. So the developer, if they're not seeing something happening, they can throw their app into bug mode and say, oh, I'm getting a message back that says no jobs found. Um, something like that. But I never return just the results. I always wrap it um, in an array so I can include other things with it. And then I use the, the app that we stored earlier. I use the JSON method. Now the JSON method does more than just JSON and code. It also sets your header for, um, what is it, application slash JSON, I think. Um, it sets that. You can do this all manually. You can create a response object, set all the headers manually if you need um, manual control over things like caching or um, any of the other headers, or you need to set your own specific custom headers. You can do that. In this case, I did not need to do any of that. So I just handed the JSON my payload array and it's returning a 200 because in a, get, a proper get it would be 200. That's not the case if you were returning from a post or a put or a delete, but in this case 200 made sense. So when you're developing with Silex and the APIs, feel free to go in, start hacking, um, start prototyping, but at some point you're going to get to the point where you've got all these routes and you're going to want to start thinking them through and grouping them and make sure your routes are proper. And then once you get them um, or properly thought out, once you get it thought out, group them and build your controllers. Building your controllers is going to make it much easier to maintain. It's going to make it a whole lot easier to test. I am required to say that because um, this is being recorded and I'm sure Chris Hart just is watching it just for this particular point. So that I say it is easier to test if you build your controllers instead of just keeping all your routes in one big file. Um, I, I also have to say that in discussions with Igor, who is one of the guys that wrote this, and I have great respect for him, um, he did not particularly agree with the way that I was doing this. He said the, you know, the, the, the mounts and the controllers were for different sections of the application, like if you had an um, admin section and things like that. And what I was trying to explain to him was this is just a sample application, but what I'm trying to show you is the proper way to do it, even though it is a bit overkill for an application this simple. Um, okay, I'm going to briefly go through this. Um, if you're deploying on GitHub, this is real easy, okay? You're using Git, you store it, if you got your config file built, uh, or your .gitignore built properly, this is not going to be a problem. Uh, if you're deploying to a phys physical or virtual server, this is going to be easy. If you're deploying to phpcloud.com um, or EngineYard or any um, platform as a service where you don't have a um, login, 
it's going to be a pain in the butt because Composer needs you to write all the, or needs you to run update. Now, Engine Yard does now support Composer. You upload um, something that's got a Composer JSON, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to run Composer for you. But there are other platforms as a service that are not nearly as complete. Um, and if you're having, if, you, if you're unfortunately having to use one of those, you're going to need something like a script like this. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this. The basic idea is we take vendor out of your Git ignore. We check. We create a new branch called deploy. We check in all of the stuff that's in vendor. We use Git to package that up and um, send it up the line, and then we reverse all those changes. And the last thing we do is we run Composer far because at this point we've deleted all the .git and .git ignores from our vendor directory, which is totally screwed it. But running Composer install will put them all back there because it'll say, oh, this is what you've got. Let me put them all back there for you. It doesn't even recognize. It's just going to re-download them all over for you. Um, this script is in the repo if you want to check it out, as well as these slides. The slides are in a PDF in the repo if you're um, looking for access to them. Um, you can just download. If you check out the repo, you'll get access to them. So, wrapping it up. In this past 45 minutes, or however long I've been talking, Silex has still not become a micro framework. It's still way too big to even be considered. However, it is still useful. It is very powerful. It, or Silex, or this is true for Zen Framework, or Symphony, or Solar, if you're familiar, or I'm sorry, Aura is the new version of Aura, or Lithium, or any of the frameworks out there are not the answer. There is no one the answer except for PHP, of course. Okay, We all know PHP is the answer to any programming problem. Um, there, is no, there is no framework that will solve all your problems. As a developer, it is important that you be familiar. You don't have to be experts in, but you need to be familiar with two or three different tools out there. You don't want to have to walk into every project and say, oh, I got a hammer, oh, I've got a hammer, so I'm going to drive everything like a nail. Get familiar with it, build a weekend project with it, see if it's what you want. There are other micro frameworks out there, or smallish frameworks out there, that might be better suited to the way you work or to what you want to do. Be familiar with them. Whether you use Silex or, or whatever, know at least two frameworks out there. Know of and be able to use at least two frameworks out there. It'll make you a better developer. That's my information. Should you happen to want to follow me, please, if you're on Twitter, follow me. I am an attention whore. I promise. I keep the profanity to a minimum, but uh, I leave that to, to Liz. So, uh, <laughs> but you ran that 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 um, visualize -y or whatever. And yeah. It, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it totally but missed bitches. I I, I do I not understand I to, how. I need to step up my game a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, I figured they've got some kind of filter problem. I did it today. Did I you? Think, so yeah. Oh, okay. Um. This is the repo. You grab the um, the slide or grab the slides or um, the entire application. Take a look at it. If you've got suggestions, if you've got ideas, if you find spelling errors, please send me a pull request. You know, um, I'm, I'm happy to check it in. And um, like I said, if you've enjoyed this, please go out to. Actually, even if you didn't enjoy this, please go out to join in and give me feedback. I win either way. If you liked it, it looks good for the um, next conference I submit to. If you didn't enjoy it, then at least I know how to make my um, presentation better. Any questions? I'm on time. Oh, you're, well, you're fine. Okay. Thank you.